but um, by next week or the week after, there's going to be some great new technology that we're going to want to use for single cell sequencing. But I'll give you a little bit of the historical context and try to build that bridge between those of you who took the bulk RNA sequencing course and then some of the lessons there that are going to transfer to single cell and some of those lessons that actually may not transfer to single cell. So the point of this session, um, understand this conceptual shift moving from bulk to single cell, uh, become acquainted with all the things that can go wrong and some of the things you have to think about when you're designing a single cell experiment in the lab and how all those design decisions are going to impact what you do with the data when it comes out of the other end of the sequencer. Uh, I'm a cancer genomics researcher, so I'm going to show two examples of how you can apply single cell sequencing specifically to cancer, so a brain cancer project and a multiple myeloma mouse project. But sort of use those not so much for the cancer biology, but really about some of the techniques that you can use to derive um, cancer genome variation from single cell data. And right at the end, I have a little like clinical vignette where we use single cell sequencing to try and understand drug response for patient um, treated with a targeted therapy. And you can really see clonal selection in action using single cell sequencing. Okay, so the fundamental unit here is single cell, and it's not really a bag of M&Ms, but it's kind of like that. It's a bit of a, a jumble of different cell types and sizes and colors and labels. Um, tissues are made of these, and where tissues are quite different is they're much more organized than a bag of candy. But the concept is really the same. It's extraordinarily heterogeneous. Some cells, some candies are similar, some are not. And we now actually have the tools to start to dissect how every cell is different and most absolutely recently, how cells interact spatially within a tissue. And I'll try to get to that point uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, single cell analysis is not new. So I've talked a lot about new technology, but people have been doing single cell genomics in general, basically since the invention of genetics. So I've just shown here in the upper left, that's actually a karyotype from one of my cells. So the old fashioned way to do single cell work, you drop your cell on a glass slide in the right cell cycle, You'd literally use scissors and glue, and you'd line up all your chromosomes side by side. Now we can do that for hundreds of thousands of cells digitally using next generation sequencing. But the idea is the same. The order of the chromosome bands, how many chromosomes do you have? Um, we used to do it one by one, and now you can do it en masse. And same thing with RNA-seq. There's actually already still clinical tests that are a single probe. In this case, this is a single uh, Epstein-Barr virus probe. So in that case, all the cancer cells lit up. Now you can put hundreds of probes or look at the entire transcriptome at the single cell level and look at them spatially as well. But the concepts, as discovered in singles in original karyotypes, still have totally hold like the rules of genetics haven't fundamentally changed, just we measure them in a different way. And we can measure way more cells um, than we've been able to in the past. The other revolution is, at least in genomics, is we're not reliant on averages. So in your bulk RNA sequencing course, you took all the cells, you ground them up, and you got the top bar graph, which is the average of all RNA sequences in a cell, or in a tissue, rather. In the bottom, now you have, can have individual cell-level measurements of RNA-seq. But everything you learned in, um, in analyzing data from bulk RNA-seq is actually relevant to the single cell as well. So you, know, you can take a lot of what you've done in differential gene expression analysis, uh, splice isoforms, all those lessons that you've uh, learned in bulk, actually will translate now to the single cells as well. Uh, I put this title in quotes because this is the understatement of 2019 in this paper. They said there's a wide variety of single cell uh, methods. This paper is already four years old, but it was basically a really excellent review of all the many different techniques that you can use to measure many different compartments within the cell. So you can look at the genome sequence, you can look at cytoplasmic RNA, you can look at intracellular proteins, uh, and then once you've done these measurements in the cell, in general, you can sort of bin these into three broad analytic groups. So lineage, how does a cell related to progenitor cells and daughter cells state? So for a single cell, what is it? That's still a bit of an existential question. How do you define a cell? Is it tags? Is it gene expression programs? Is it protein? You'll probably get into that question multiple times throughout the next couple of days and trajectory. So you're, when we do an experiment, we capture a single cell at a single point in time. What could happen to it, uh, cells like it, potentially in light of treatment, and what has happened to cells that gave rise to the point in time that you looked at. So some of the most powerful experiments are really those longitudinal experiments where you can look at, for example, a mouse model at multiple different time points and see how that cellular makeup, but also cell states actually change over time. And there's a lot of bioinformatics methods to 
uh, sort of operate in th these three broad areas, lineage, state, and trajectory. Um, so I do want to highlight some of the considerations and um, experimental design parameters that, especially as an analyst, you really need to know, like what has happened in the lab. And ideally, this is a partnership between the wet lab scientist and the uh, dry lab scientist to co-develop what is actually going to happen to the tissue or the cells before you analyze it. It's very painful sometimes to kind of inherit a data set and not to have participated in the wet lab design. And vice versa, it's very tricky for the wet lab uh, scientists to design those experiments without knowing what's going to happen in the dry lab uh, downstream. So you really want these two aspects of, of essentially single cell genomics to happen simultaneously. Uh, I put this also in quotes because it's also um, a bit of an understatement. It's actually um, on the y-axis is time, and then, or on the y-axis is number of cells, the x-axis is time, and it really is an exponential scaling of single cells. So it used to be literally a single cell in an Eppendorf tube, then it was in a plate, then there were microfluidic devices, then there were robotics that let you profile hundreds of plates simultaneously. Almost, maybe not all, but a huge fraction of the uh, data present, uh, generated nowadays is using a 10x genomics platform. This is a droplet-based method. Uh, and then there's other methods that are flow sorting cells into individual wells. So the point of this slide is, is to show the huge growth, and it actually continues to ramp upward, uh, but also the many different ways to isolate and do molecular biology on single cells. And this, uh, this paper actually does a really great job marching through all these different technologies that ultimately result in very similar data, which is gene counts from a single cell. Um, that being said, there are sort of three main steps that are going to influence the type and the nature of the of your data um, of, of, uh, of your data as you receive it. Uh, the first is tissue uh, digestion and cell purification. So even just the very act of collecting a cell will change its state. And if you freeze it, uh, viably freeze it or snap freeze it, that is going to fundamentally change um, the transcriptional representation in all of those cells. And that's okay, as long as you're uh, collecting and sampling all your tissues in uh, using a common protocol. Um, you don't want to mix single nuclei data and single cell data, at least not know that that was consciously done as an experimental design consideration. You want to have a single protocol that's really trying to treat all your samples, especially if you're trying to compare them over time. Um, like your barcoding, this is sort of the secret to high throughput sequencing of single cells. So if you have a, a plate, a three to four well plate, a single cell in every well, the way to be able to sequence these is to give each individual well a different barcode. But there's lots of different barcoding strategies. So you have to know what barcodes are used for your specific experiment. So you can sort of unscramble that egg after you've done uh, the sequencing. And even the sequencer choice, um, certainly Illumina sequencing is the most ubiquitous platform. But there are other uh, long read platforms, for example, that will give you full length transcripts. And the data actually looks quite different than some of these short read technologies. And I'll have a few examples of those later on. Uh, so here are some of the design decisions that these three steps to consider. Uh, do you have bulk profiling data? Is the plan to do single cell and to combine that with bulk uh, profiling data? Do you, are you interested in all cells in a tissue or do you actually only care about a subset? You only care about T cells, so go through a specific manipulation to isolate T cells, flow cytometry, bead, uh, bead selection. Um, Molecular barcoding, are you going to do full length transcripts? Are you going to do just the end reads like is done with the 10X genomics platform? Each of these is a, has to be a conscious decision as you set up your experiment. And then there's a huge number of bioinformatics platforms. So I had that lineage, those uh, lineage state and, and trajectory. You have to think carefully and understand those specific algorithms, and you'll get some, ex uh, some experience with those this week. Um, think about why you're choosing a, a specific algorithm or another. Or if you're not sure, have a benchmarking plan to have two algorithms or four algorithms potentially combined or compared uh, against one another. But that has to be a conscious part of your uh, analytic design strategy. Uh, and this paper here really goes through all these three steps in great detail. <clears throat> I just want to go into a little more detail in those three specific steps. There's lots of ways to isolate single cells. So this is just to figure with a few of these. Uh, I mentioned plate-based methods. Um, there's literally a pipette, so pulling individual cells out of the media. Um, there's flow cytometry. You can sort either a cell population of interest or just digest a tissue and sort all the cells into a plate. Uh, laser capture microdissection. Uh, you can literally take a laser, cut out a single cell, pick it up, and sequence it. 
Uh, microfluidics, this is essentially encapsulating your cells in an oil droplet. Each cell gets an oil droplet and they sort of march through your, your microfluidic device. Um, open single cell chambers, so essentially a field with little cell size pits. So a cell comes along, it drops in, you do your molecular biology inside there. Um, and this is a little esoteric, essentially it's magnetic posts with antibodies. So you can flow a blood sample through and the cells will stick to your posts. So you can really work with biomedical engineers to get extremely creative. What you want at the end of the day are uh, free, essentially free floating or isolated cells that aren't stuck to any other, so you can actually isolate that cell as a single unit. Uh, protocol we've been using quite a bit in our cancer genomics lab is single nuclei sequencing. So just because you've frozen the cell doesn't mean uh, you can't use it. One downside, especially with snap freezing, is you actually will lyse the cytoplasm, but it turns out actually nuclei are quite hardy. So our solution to working with uh, frozen tissues is to do a nuclei preparation. So you take a, a, a frozen tissue, you isolate the nuclei, but that's now a conscious design decision. You've now lost all cytoplasmic transcripts. So you're going to see that in your data. You also are enriched for unspliced RNA. So now you're going to have a lot of the introns in that data as well. So that decision in the lab has now really fundamentally changed your data downstream, but it does open up a whole world of biobanked or fresh frozen samples that are quite ubiquitous and relatively easy to get your hands on. Uh, once we have the, the uh, nuclei, you kind of treat them like a cell, like they can go into the 10x protocol, they can be encapsulated in an oil droplet, uh, and it has some pros and cons, which I've uh, just listed there on the screen, but it does fundamentally change the sequencing reads that you're going to get out uh, at the end of the experiment. Um, one gremlin when working with uh, fresh, uh, never frozen versus fresh frozen tissues is different cells are more susceptible to lysis when you freeze them. So this is an experiment where they took the same tissue, they, ice, they um, profiled half of it without freezing it, the other half they isolated the nuclei and did single cell sequencing. And what this shows down here is the cells have now all been clustered into different transcriptional groups and they've clustered all this data together, cells, nuclei, and together. And you can even see by eye this great big purple cluster, hardly seen at all in the nuclei. And then um, some of these more minor clusters here are not necessarily seen in the cells. And you can actually see the difference in frequency. So there really is a cell-specific freezing artifact. So by going down the road of fresh frozen versus nuclei, um, sort of appreciate that your cell fractions are going to be different because different cells are going to um, essentially come out of freeze or not freeze, um, not survive the freeze process. If these two methods were totally equal, these frequency bars should be perfectly 50-50. And you can tell by either totally not. And that's really a fundamental difference between looking at intact cells, including the cytoplasm, versus uh, just looking at the nuclei. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just what kind of samples do you have and what's your scientific question? Um, you're going to hear and probably work with at least one of these different types of data. Two of the most commonly employed RNA sequencing uh, strategies are 10x genomics uh, end reads. So this is essentially priming off either the three prime end or the five prime end and just sequencing the ends of your transcripts. Uh, so originally described as drop seq, but now it's uh, commercialized. There's this 10x uh, genomics chromium device. Smart seq 2 is different. You actually put cells in individual wells. And you sequence the entire trans you sequence the entire transcript, so it has the benefit that you get full length, but the cost is much higher and the scale is much lower. So in this case, you get hundreds to hundreds of thousands of cells. This you're sort of limited to what you can manipulate in a, a plate in the lab, but it has this benefit if you really are interested in full length transcripts. You want to do mutation calling across the whole transcript. If splice site inf or splicing information is very important, uh, the SmartC2 method is really where you want to go. If you want to just count transcripts, uh, if you want to look at T and B cell uh, rearrangements or T and B cell repertoire, 10x genomics, 10, the 10x approach is going to give you the scale, the number of cells that uh, you're going to need to sort of dissect these cellular populations, especially if you're looking at uh, large intact uh, tissues. Um, and here's kind of an example of what I just talked about. So SmartC2 gives you really nice coverage across an exon. The intron spliced out, get another intron, exon spliced out, and so on. Chromium is totally different. You just get essentially very one sided data. You prime here, and all your reads sort of pile up at one or the other end uh, of the transcript. Uh, and then 
differences in scale as well. You get many, many more cells for the same price uh, using the 10x approach. Uh, another method, especially for the very, very long transcripts, so the downside with uh, short read sequencing is you're really only going to read 100 to 150 bases. Transcripts are much, much longer. They could be uh, roughly 1,000 or multi multiple thousands. The downside with short read sequencing, you take your DNA, you fragment it into these small pieces, and you try to assemble them, um, looking at overlapping sequences. Long read sequencing, you just read across the whole fragment in one big shot. So it really lets you look at some of these very subtle, especially exon usage uh, information and transcript structure information, because you just have a single read that covers the whole thing. Uh, there is a cost difference. You get many, many more short reads using Illumina. You get fewer reads using long, fewer long reads, but they're long, so you can cover the whole transcript. So you sort of have these two uh, options. Yes. Um I covered this in the salt sequencing, but I forget why it's fragmented. Like, why not prime on the intact DNA and then just kind of get the, uh, the It's a problem with the sequencer itself. So every base you read suffers a slight decline in quality. So you start out with perfect quality, then you're 99, then you're 98. And by the time you hit 150, it's that quality is actually really falling off the cliff. So it's a problem with Illumina sequencing and other short read methods specifically. Whereas um, Nanopore will just go until you hit the end, essentially. Uh, and this is sort of an example of what that type of data would look like side by side. So if you have this gene, you have all these different splice isoforms, short read sequencing, you basically have to look for missing data and little bridge reads that bridge between exons. With long reads, you just shoot across it and you get a full, uh, fully assembled transcript. Um, so that's sort of the um, introduction to sequencing types and generating data. Uh, I then wanted to get into um, trying to take some of your past knowledge and apply it to single cell. And this is, especially in the early days, this is really quite surprising where I especially would work with a lot of immunologists where a lot of the markers on individual cells were extremely well worked out. But when we tried to look for those transcripts in our single cell data, they were, um, the expression level was relatively spotty or some of those markers we didn't even see at all on the gene expression level. Uh, so that's what this paper describes. So they did a, a, a large, uh, mostly T and B cell uh, experiment and then you sort of score out each of the clusters that are up here in the upper left for individual markers. And you can see just by eye, you know, some markers are looking pretty good, like this cluster here really expressed uh, CD3. But some of these you can hardly see at all. You get this very spotty uh, expression level. And this is really a downside with single cell sequencing. Since you're reliant on that single cell, if you're a little, if you're a rare, P, if you have a um, gene that's expressed at a very low level, you have these very rare fragments, and they don't happen to be sampled or amplified in your reaction, you're not going to see them. So if you have um, genes that are expressed right at the limit of detection of single cell, you're either going to have what I sort of showed up here, you'll sort of have the stochastic detection of those transcripts, or no detection of those transcripts at all. And really where we've had to go for single cell is not necessarily rely on these individual markers, but instead move to gene sets that would tag these individual cells as surrogates for those individual or usually originally protein-based markers. So there's really a disconnect between uh, the RNA expression and the, uh, the protein expression. Uh, to get around this, there's this, uh, this uh, protocol invented called SiteSeq, uh, uh, cellular indexing of transcriptomes and epitopes by sequencing. The way this works, they sort of co-opted the droplet-based uh, method you actually have this antibody with this synthetic uh, bar molecular barcode attached to it. So every single cell that's expressing your protein of interest will bind this antibody. That cell coated with however many antibodies you've tagged all gets encapsulated into the oil droplet. You then burst the cell, you sequence the RNA like you normally would, but also all those antibody bound tags also come along for the ride. So you know what tags you put into your experiment. You can count those tags and that enables you to count antibody binding events, as well as all of the RNA sequencing. So this is a very powerful method to start to integrate um, RNA uh, sequencing with uh, a protein measurement literally from the same cell. And you can see in this experiment, this is the same figure I just showed earlier, but now I've added the site seek the protein data. And you can see for some of these that were previously quite spotty, really roar out uh, using the, using the protein-based method. So in this case, you can actually integrate these two different data types literally from the exact same cell and use that for cell identification. Do you have a question? It's your ability to, uh, you sort of think of um, 
your gene expression levels is uh, a distribution. You have some very high, highly expressed genes. Most of them are in the middle, and some are very expressed at a very low level. Uh, when we do sequencing, you're basically grabbing or sampling from that distribution. So you see basically all the highly expressed genes. You see some of the uh, genes expressed in the middle. But if you're grabbing from this distribution, you're actually very unlikely to grab those genes that are expressed at a very, very low level. Uh, and depending on how many sequencing reads you generate, that's how many sample, samples of that population that you have. So if you only do, let's say, 50,000 reads for a single cell, that's 50,000 chances to try to grab a rare transcript. And sometimes it's actually uh, not enough. Uh, so that limited detection is a function of the ability to turn the original RNA into cDNA that gets sequenced, uh, but also the number of reads that you happen to generate for a single cell. I don't know if the there's a perfect limit of detection. Like I can say it's like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand because it's quite confounded by your cell type, that actual distribution of transcripts in a single cell, which is quite different depending on your cell type. But in general, the rare transcripts are much harder to find, especially using 10x. Mm -hmm. It would help to a point. Um, the way at least 10x sequencing works is it relies on poly A priming and then an extension. Um, but if that poly A um, on your rare transcript just didn't happen to be primed, didn't have enough primer, or the primer just didn't find the poly A, then you're never going to see it. You could sequence it to infinity, and you still wouldn't see that transcript. Any other questions? Yeah. With Cytic, is possible to distinguish like highly expressed protein and low expressed protein, like MFI at the floor? Yeah, it, um, it is quantitative. Um, so because you are counting antibody binding uh, events, uh, it's limited by your ability to find antibodies. Yeah, so it's yeah. different from single cell or from whole transcriptome where you sequence uh, everything. Uh, in this case, there are antibody or site seek panels, which are on the order of two to 300, maybe 400 antibodies that you could include. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? All right. Um, and then, yeah, this is one of my newer slides. Um, everything we just talked about can now be done in relation to a cell's position relative to all other cells, um, all other cells in a sample. So I talked a lot early on about uh, cell isolation or purifying cells. If you really aren't interested in a single cell population, you just want to know what you have in your actual tissue, you can just cut your tissue, cut a section, 10 micron section, 4 micron section, put it onto a glass slide, and now there are methods to actually image the RNA in place on a slide. So that's what the starry night figure is showing. Each of these little tiny dots is a, is a, uh, a cell. And then all the colors are different transcripts. So the way this method works is you get a panel of two to 400 RNA probes, just like I showed that original virus example. And you could do 400 of those probes. And now you can analyze not just the expression of transcripts in a single cell, but you also get this matrix of all cells by all cells and how far they are away from one another. So it's almost like another piece of metadata. So essentially this picture just turns into a huge matrix of how far are you away from other cells. And you can get quite creative to say, I'm interested in this cell state or this cell trajectory. And I wanna know how that trajectory changes as you're looking inside of, of a piece of tissue. Um, so spatial marketing looks like this, but in bioinformatics, it's actually just a huge square table of distances. Uh, so don't let these type of figures sort of worry you. It's really all about what's the distance between two cells. And it's just another piece of metadata that lets you draw relationships between different cells. And that's what this local neighborhood idea is. I want to know how far my T cell is from a cancer cell. You can now readily do that. You go through a round of labeling to label your T cells and your cancer cells. And you go through a round of distance analysis. Now you know what your cells are. What's their distance like as an example? I guess a plug for Prince's Market Genomic Center. We just bought one of these. So if you want to do single cell, we offer our single cell spatial transcriptomics. Uh, we offer this as a service. And I'm not going to belabor this. Suffice to say, there's a huge number of bioinformatics tools. I heard at the Single Cell Atlas, someone said there's more tools than users. So there's a huge number of, you, of tools out in the world. You really need to read these uh, papers carefully and work with your colleagues to really figure out what is the right tool for the right uh, the right job? This is already a, out of date. This is 2015. There's just been an explosion of tools to do lineage, state, trajectory, 
Um, you want a good reality check from your colleagues in the field as to what has worked for them for a question that is similar or the same to yours. Okay, so I'm okay, we're right on time. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to show, yeah, Gary. I'll try to make that a lot of these tools are redundant, so same, so like 50 tools trying to solve the same problem, and probably almost all of them do almost the same thing. There still are good ideas, new ideas out there, but there are a lot of redundant mm -hmm. ideas too. Uh, yeah, so I said I'm from a cancer background, so I'm going to really um, put all the background I just talked about into the context of two cancer projects um, that, that we worked on in the lab. And really the idea is the complex heterogeneity that is a tumor. So a tumor is dynamic cells come and go, there's immune responses, there's different cancer subclones, there are a mixture of different cell types, there's cancer cells, immune cells, stromal cells, and they change over time. So single cell sequencing has totally transformed our approach to trying to understand cancer biology landscapes at a single time point, but also in the context of treatment and trying to understand how cancers develop uh, from the earliest stages and then how do they change once they're treated. Um, so single cell RNA seq in practice, how did cancers, uh, cancers and immune cells change over time? So this is sort of a theoretical patient's journey, tumor burden is sort of a surrogate for tumor size or tumor stage. Um, so the earliest of cancers, so I'm going to talk about some single cell RNA sequencing of a mouse model to understand the earliest of cancers. So this is a mouse that is going to get myeloma within 70 weeks. So you have the opportunity to look at how does that evolution happen? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about single cell RNA sequencing while you're on a trial. So once you're treated, what is the effect of treatment? Why do you relapse? And then what, what next treatment might be effective based on a single cell profile? So I'm going to talk about um, uh, the myeloma mouse model first. So really starting to watch specifically immune cells evolve at the single cell level uh, as cancer develops over time. And there's two papers here that you can uh, read if you want to get to really get into the details. So a little bit on myeloma. Multiple myeloma actually begins, it's, uh, it's a cancer of B cells, cancer of the bone marrow. It begins as a, this um, benign condition. And actually, it's quite common, uh, especially as you age, you get this monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. It then transforms into what's called smoldering myeloma. This is sort of a malignant state. You again get a full-blown uh, diagnosis of multiple myeloma. The goal in myeloma treatment is to debulk the cancer and get it down to minimal residual disease. Myeloma is actually not curable. So the current um, standard of care is monitoring a minimal residual disease, usually through a bone marrow aspirate. So you have access to cells uh, from the bone marrow. Uh, and if there is a relapse, we want to understand why did they relapse and what is the next treatment that we could use to uh, treat this now relapsed uh, myeloma. So we have a mouse that does exactly this. So it's called the B kappa mic mouse. So it, it, it there's a B in the immunoglobulin locus with the stop codon. And essentially you wait around for those B cells to mature until that stop codon is reversed. And essentially now you have overactivation of this mic oncogene. And what happens over time, over 70 weeks is you have these no disease mice. At some point that mic gene gets turned on. So you get this AMG, which is MGUS for mice. And then you get multiple myeloma and you can actually take their, uh, their femurs and take their bone marrow and look at this specific protein. So it's sort of a protein marker that you can see build up over time. So you know when you can actually take these samples for single cell analysis. So we had 12 mice uh, captured at these different time points. So we integrated all 90,000 cells as so we did this all with the 10X genomics platform. Uh, we didn't do any cell selection because we didn't know what cells were going to be important. We knew there were going to be cancer cells. We knew there were going to be other cells also in the bone marrow. So our laboratory strategy was comprehensive, sequence every cell, and then see how they change over time. So step one was to integrate them so we could compare all these, uh, all the data over different time points. And you can see all the many different cell types we saw. Some of them the same cell type, but their states or trajectories are changing over time. The beauty of single cell data is you don't have to eat the whole cake at once. You can look at specific cells you're really interested in uh, for a specific question. So we wanted to know about plasma cells at the very beginning. So we're interested in how do normal plasma cells become cancer cells? So we knew from a gene set, uh, from a gene set analysis, which of these were from the B cell lineage. So they were all of these. So we pulled out informatically, pulled out these individual cells 
and reclustered them. So we're really looking for different uh, for specific and more uh, high resolution clusters specifically in this plasma cell population. So this little plot here is only the cells um, does this show up? Yeah, only the cells uh, associated with that B cell lineage. And if you color them by mice, there's some mixing of mice and there's some um, some clusters that are unique. Uh, to mice. So like this huge purple population is all coming from one mouse, and some of these are all admixed. And if you sort all of these clusters by time point, you can see that normal plasma cell clusters are shared basically by everybody. So even when you have late myeloma, you still have a few of these, um, a, a few normal plasma cells. There's these curious, not the original B cells, but they're not cancer B cells. They're kind of, they're, but they're only found in the no disease mice. So we tag these as early disease. There's this AMG cluster. These are still B cells, but only in the AMG time point. And then once you get to myeloma, every single cell is different. So essentially you see this broadening and differentiation over time. You start with a B cell that is healthy and every mouse has it. And as you sort of march down this uh, sort of journey to cancer, you essentially completely diverge. And none of the myelomas, even though all these mice are genetically identical, all have completely different uh, transcriptional programs for their full-blown disease. And that kind of reflects what we see in cancer. Myeloma is extremely heterogeneous. Uh, and you can sort of see everyone starts out with these normal cells that eventually become um, totally different from each other. So that was sort of our lesson looking at the cancer cells. So I saw this trajectory, this movement of the, of, the, uh, of the B cells. Now we're interested in the T cells. We want to understand why do these myeloma cells get a foothold and why do they even persist? Why isn't the mouse's immune system clearing these cancers out? So we pulled out specifically the T cell population, and one of the roles is that the T cells is cancer surveillance. They're supposed to be going around killing all these malignant cells. And what we actually saw in our control mice and our no disease mice, we actually scored all these T cells for they're actually multiple exhaustion T cell exhaustion signatures. We took these from the literature and scored our mice for this exhaustion signature. So it's a list of I forget it's like twenty to thirty genes. Um, you can see here in the control mice and no disease mice, you essentially have not exhausted, normal T cells. But as you go through AMG into full-blown myeloma, essentially you are losing T cell, uh, T cell function. You're basically your exhaustion score is starting to go up. And if we pulled these cells out and then validated them using markers for exhausted T cells using flow cytometry, we actually see the same thing. So really these VCAPMIC mice over time are getting increasingly exhausted. And essentially these T cells are not doing the cancer surveillance as they should be. And that's allowing the myeloma to uh, fully develop. So the question was, okay, we have these two models. We know myeloma is developing, and we know T cell exhaustion is an issue. It's a feature of these uh, cancerous bone marrows. Uh, can we combat exhaustion? So in this case, we had an anti-LAG3, anti-PD1 antibody. So these are therapies that reinvigorate T cells, and we actually showed the ability to delay the onset of multi-myeloma. So it didn't completely turn on these T cells forever, but essentially push them into a functional state where you could delay the onset of myeloma. And you could see that right at the single cell level by looking, in that case, at the, at the M protein, but also looking at the mouse's survival over time. And that was really the goal of our single cell experiment one, was to understand cancer evolution, understand T cell responses. But then that last step, and it's good to plan this right at the beginning of the experiment, is that validation. What's that validation of your biological observation going to be? In our case, it was mouse survival, and we were able to show that. Uh, the last project is actually one I worked on with uh, Gary's group, looking at uh, glioblastoma stem cells and looking at a uh, subclonal analysis of subclonal cancer populations that exist in, uh, in brain tumors. Uh, also published, if you really want to get into the details, has 40 pages of supplemental methods. So if you really want to get into the details, it's like a little textbook on how to do single cell work. Uh, the assumption here was really all based around there's a glioblastoma stem cell. So the idea you have these cancer stem cells that inhabit the bulk tumor. And the idea is chemotherapy is clearing out the bulk tumor, but the cancer stem cells are, are resilient to it, either because they're not proliferating or they're either just not being selected by chemotherapy. And they're the ones that give relapse to the bulk tumor. And the goal of this entire project was to come up with therapies directed against cancer stem cells. So if you pick them out specifically, then the bulk will just die. You don't, the uh, glioblastoma would lose this ability to repopulate the bulk. So that was the hypothesis going in. 
And that's why we're so interested in single cell because bulk sequencing grinds up all the signal and you can't see the cancer stem cell signal. Uh, in this case, um, we had worked with um, two um, sort of two brain experts, Peter Dirks and Sam Weiss. They have the ability to take a, a, a patient's tumor, uh, digest it into free-floating single cells, and then each lab has different ways to do this. One uses flow cytometry to put these into wells, and then you grow up your culture in a single well, um, whereas Peter's group had essentially a plate. You grow up your cells in a plate. You select using uh, media, select for brain tumor stem cells. At the end of the day, you get the ex ex expanded and enriched brain tumor stem cell cultures that we could then use for single cell analysis. So very different from the myeloma experiment. Myeloma experiment, we're grinding up and sequencing every single cell. This is the exact opposite, where we knew the cell population we wanted to go for. So we went through all this trouble to isolate the cancer stem cell specifically. So the first question was, are these all genetically and transcriptionally the same? So are brain tumor stem cells totally homogeneous or are they totally heterogeneous? So we had 29 uh, patient-derived uh, stem cell cultures. I wanted to use single cell sequencing to answer this question. And the answer was it's both. Some of the cultures are, perhaps not surprisingly, some of the cultures are clonal. So I've sorted all these cultures by uh, the number of subclones. So these ones up here, had two, what appeared to be two subclones. It actually turned out the first subclone was always a cycling a population of cells, and the second was in a different cell cycle. So while you see brown and green, they're actually the same cell identity, but they're at different pos uh, positions in the cell cycle. Even though they're supposed to be synchronized, we always had this little non-proliferating um, population. We always had a proliferating population. Um, so that sort of explained the first row. As you get to the second row, you can see three, four, and if you get to this really complex, this IDH mutant uh, brain tumor, you see a huge number of different subclones. Uh, you sort of see this distribution here, but it really was giving us insight into how different these different cultures were. And this may explain the differences that we saw in some of the drug screening experiments that were being done in these uh, cell lines. Uh, another hypothesis we had for all these subclones is, is it being driven by genetics? Are there additional chromosomes? Are there additional mutations that it sort of explain the subclonal structure? Uh, so if we took three, uh, three of these samples, we had a tumor infiltrating uh, immune cell, we had cancer cells, and we had the glioblastoma line. In this case, we used a trick. Instead of doing pathway analysis using biological pathways, we used pathway analysis using chromosomes. We took all the chromosomes on chromosome one, all the genes rather, on chromosome one, and then did a differential gene expression to all the other chromosomes. And what we found was a gain of chromosome seven. So the two cancer populations here are showing very high upregulation of all genes on chromosome seven. And we knew in these two lines, they had a copy number gain, had extra chromosomal copies uh, of that specific chromosome. And you don't have that in the normal diploid uh, T cells. And it also works for deletions as well. So inferred uh, down regulation of this pseudo pathway, but it was actually just all genes on chromosome 10 all showed low expression, and that because one of the chromosome, the uh, copies of chromosome 10 was just missing. So you could use a tool that already existed, but throw out the biology and look, just look at the physical position on the chromosome, and you can infer uh, copy number changes, um, copy number changes across the entire genome. So taking that lesson, you can actually apply that to an entire uh, glioblastoma stem cell line. So here's one line. We saw four uh, subclones. And the way to read these, each little tiny, like one pixel thick line here is a different single cell. And each row is a different chromosome. You can see by eye, chromosome seven, every single cell basically had gain of seven. Only a subset of the, of the uh, cells actually had loss of 10. So every single gene on chromosome 10 in the subset of cells showed low expression. That's extremely unlikely um, due to gene regulation or a, a pathway regulation. It's much more likely that that DNA was just wasn't there and that's why those genes are being expressed. And you can go down even lower. So this little tiny pink cluster uh, is characterized by a gain of chromosome 20. And you can really go down the rabbit hole and start to pick out like little sub, 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 sub clones and basically until you run out of cells, but you can build these really beautiful uh, phylogenetic trees of all the relationships purely using a copy number data still derived from RNA. So even though it's a DNA feature, you can infer the DNA feature from RNA expression. Um, just like in the myeloma mice, when you try to cluster all the uh, glioblastoma stem cells at the uh, global level, 
they never cluster together. So there's really something fundamental at the, both the DNA level, but also at the transcriptome level. So this was a bit of an issue. Um, in general, if you had lines from the same tumors, they're similar. They're more similar to each other than they are to other patients, but you don't sort of get that blending like you did in the mice of all the T cells and B cells and all the other non-malignant cells. And this is a, a phenomenon that's been um, reported across virtually all cancer types. Each patient's tumor really is, uh, really is distinct. The question we want to answer is, is there any common biology? So even if every single gene isn't beautifully correlated across patients, is there a therapeutic vulnerability that you can exploit? So in this study, we're looking at um, developmental at, um, at gradients. We're trying to say, okay, we know they're not different, but is there, just like in trajectory, is there a, a gradient of biology that sort of explains this variation across all glioblastoma stem cells? And there are really two signatures that uh, came to attention a developmental signature and an injury response signature. So developmental here in red. So if you're high in development, you're generally low for injury. If you're high for injury, you're low for development. So the model that we extracted out of the single cell data is these. this is basically an axis. And depending on where your cell went wrong, it sort of came out of that gradient. Uh, that sort of defines the biology for that tumor. And you can see here, in general, all the cells from a, a glioblastoma stem cell are heavily development and low in injury or high in injury and low in development. So there's still some of these in the middle where you sort of get the two gradients kind of crossing. And actually this is a better visualization of it where you can really see um, not trying to put hard thresholds on biology. And that was the other like big finding out of this paper was moving away from being overly compartmentalized with these cancer subtypes and instead sort of tolerating some co continuity of scoring uh, 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 across all your different uh, cancer models. And that's really what this uh, figure is showing here. It's not like there's development or injury, it's a continuous model. Um, we then took what we learned from the purified glioblastoma stem cells and we jumped back to the primary tumor. So you still wanted to see, can we find a sig this signal, these little tiny cancer stem cells in the overall bulk? Uh, and did we did. So if you take the injury and response um, gradients, super clean in the cell lines. You get two really nice peaks, the developmental ones and the injury ones. But you look at bulk cells, you can still kind of see that signal there, but it's being masked by all the bulk tumor that don't necessarily uh, follow this gradient. So the stem cells are on the gradient, but the bulk tumor is not. They're basically fountaining out these abnormal cells that aren't necessarily perfectly on the gradient where the, uh, where the stem cells were. Uh, some of these tumors more pure than others. So you can definitely see the signals in there but it's not something you necessarily would have seen certainly using bulk sequencing and even using unselected cell sequencing, this biology is not necessarily apparent. Uh, and this is the final uh, model. Gary actually named this the peanut wizard hat because we used to have it oriented this way with the hat going with the black bar going up. <laughs> you can, uh, the peanut is the developmental injury response gradient and these stem cells are then fountaining out these mature astrocyte tumor cells. So essentially they're pumping out bulk tumor, but this is the problem with combating the bulk tumor, the black part, you still are um, retaining this, the stem cell model. And the research now is around, what do we do about these stem cells? How do you pick out cells that are at either end or in the middle of this gradient? Um, so this is a single cell project sort of took us into this whole new uh, area of research. Uh, and then we validated also using uh, a CRISPR screens as well. So this is work with Stefan on Jay. He said, we found this gradient. They have this massive, um, this massive uh, CRISPR library, and essentially all the uh, glioblastoma cell lines that were on the injury response end all had their, had uh, CRISPR vulnerabilities for injury response genes. And same story on the other end of the gradient; those were all the developmental response genes. So, really encouraging you to think not just to your UMAP or your TISNI plot, but that one extra step: what's your validation experiment going to look like? Are you going to go back into bulk tumors? Are you going to go do a CRISPR experiment? Model, mouse model, think, uh, plan that ahead. And I'll just, I know I'm running out of time here, so I just wanted to skip to my last anecdote, which was um, this patient here. So this is an individual with multiple myeloma, just like we did with the mice. We've got a bone marrow aspirate. We did single cell sequen sequencing on their bone marrow aspirate. We isolated the T cells and were able to pick out uh, definitely an enrichment for exhausted T cells in their population. We also zoomed in specifically on their cancer cells. So this big population here is the malignant multi myeloma cells. 
And we, in this case, we actually had two samples. We had uh, before treatment and after treatment. And the treatment that they were on was an FGFR3 inhibitor. Uh, and it actually worked very badly. And actually that drug's been taken off the market now because all the patients were progressing. So we want to understand why that, why that was. So when we zoomed in on their sequencing reads, so here's their, here are four clusters. The top two were only seen pre-treatment, bottom two were only seen post-treatment. And if you zoom in on their individual sequencing reads, all these cells in cluster two, I've just shown four of them here, all had this in-frame um, activating deletion within FGFR3. And in fact, that's the exact cluster that fully melted away. And then this large cluster that has deletion of 17P, which is a very aggressive marker of multimyeloma, this subclone that only had very, very few cells pre-treatment essentially filled the niche. So it actually turned out this drug is amazingly specific and highly effective against the subclonal population with this deletion of FGFR3, but it's totally ineffective against this resistant population. So it actually turns out it's an excellent drug, but the selection of the patients is a problem. In this case, they were choosing patients who had these heter highly heterogeneous tumors. It worked perfectly in the exact cells that were only visible with single cell sequencing, but it's all the other cells that didn't have this mutation that explained uh, their relapse. Uh, so just to revisit the learning objectives we had at the start, there's a huge number of single cell sequencing uh, technologies. You really want to tailor them to your specific scientific question. You can measure the same biology multiple different ways. So you can measure the biology using protein, like with SiteSeq. You can do that CRISPR screen experiment. You can have a mouse model and then compare it to humans. There's lots of different ways. These are all hammers looking for nails. Uh, so you really need to tailor these experimental techniques to your specific question. Um, you can assay multiple different cellular compartments. If you're really interested in nuclei, you can isolate just the nuclei. If you want the cell surface protein, you can use SiteSeq. Um, Think about whether you need to do cell selection. Are you only interested in T cells or do you want to do agnostic sequencing like we did in the myeloma mouse? And then you really want to be critical of your own data. So fact check uh, data quality. If you've got an outlier, is it technical or is it really exciting biology? Uh, be critical of the, your integrations. Your T cells in general should link to, should integrate together. It's very rare that cancer cells will integrate beautifully together. Uh, and then use orthogonal techniques. Use single cell sequencing maybe for discovery but think ahead to what that validation experiment needs to look like. Um, is it a clinical outcome? Is it a functional screen? Um, think all the way through from the tissue all the way through to your final analysis. And I'll leave it there. I listed a huge number of papers. They're all in the, the slide deck. Um, postdoc with Gary and I, uh, her name is Shamini. She runs this single cell group that's really focused on spatial transcriptomics. So if you'd like to join that group uh, beyond this course, uh, that's our Slack channel link there. You can uh, click that link and it'll uh, link you into that working group. And my email is here too.